you better get ready. You remember I was teaching you earlier about the early church. The 120, if you were one of the 120 that was up in the upper room and that was all, after three years of ministry, that's all Jesus could put together was 120 people, right? Twelve of them were the original disciples. The rest of them, all them with me was to hang out with. I don't mean that in a negative way. But after three years of teaching, the only thing that Jesus could put together was 120 people. They went up in the upper room. You know about that in Acts chapter 2. Now, so they go in the upper room, and then the Holy Ghost falls with flames of fire, and they began to speak in tongues. There was a whole lot of people in Jerusalem celebrating the Pentecost. It was a big festival. A lot of people were selling and bartering and making money off the Pentecost. The Pentecost festival it had nothing to do with the whole. The Pentecost at that day had nothing to do with the Holy Ghost. It was just one of the feast days that, that Moses had established in the teaching of the, of the law. So that happened on Pentecost, right? Uh, rather than the harvest of weeks, which it could be called the same thing. But so here's what happened. Anybody, want to say this to you, anybody that was in that upper room on a Pentecost day probably most likely were either killed shortly thereafter. And this is the price that one had to pay for the early church. I remember my, uh, uh, my New Testament, uh, uh, church history rather, a church history professor and the church history, they had a segment called the early church, then the church of the middle ages. And the, uh, and then of course there, there was a Catholic church and then there's a, the, so the early church people, most of them died to establish the church. What the things was in the, in the church history, you'll discover if you study church history intensely like I did in seminary, you will discover that not only did Jesus die to establish the church, but just about everybody who's with Jesus also died to establish the church. Thus was born, Peter was, a, Peter was uh, uh, John the Baptist was beheaded. Peter was crucified. Paul was beheaded. And people of less a note were also thrown to the lions, many of them. Many of them were thrown in jail by the apostle Paul himself and possibly killed in jail by the Apostle Paul. Um, and so it was a treacherous time. So the, the church itself, well, only the blood of Jesus will save you from your sins, from your foolishness, from your faults, and from your fears. You know, the blood of Jesus not only will save you from your sin, but it'll save you from your fears. If you got any fears or faults or foolishness, the blood of Jesus will save you from that too. But the purpose is to save you from your sin. But the blood of Jesus established the church, but there's a whole lot of other people, uh, established salvation rather, but there's a whole lot of other people in the New Testament and in the early church days, Dr. Robert Handy was my church professor, the, the esteemed Dr. Robert Handy, teaching that a lot of other people, the church was built on the blood, the flesh, who people who died. The Romans killed them. First of all, the Jews were killing Christians like it was okay. I mean, they were just, after they killed Jesus, they went on a, on a tear, just killing Christians at will. The Jews did, and Romans did too. And, and so that's, that, that's why we have Dr. Handy teaching and the early church history, and in fact, demonstrating the only reason why we have the book of Corinth, the book of Galatia, the book of Philippi, the, the book of Ephesus, uh, the, the, the book of Colossae, uh, and, and the book of Romans, and uh, the church in, uh, in uh, Laodicea, and Thyatira, and Pergamos. The only reason why we have that information is because they were killing Christians, those 120 that were being killed after coming down out that upper room. So they fled to these cities. And that's why, because they weren't, these weren't Jewish cities, these were Greek cities with all that Greek stuff going on up in there. But the Jews fled there and they set up secret private churches. And Paul went and visited them and helped establish the church. So the church history demonstrates that the early church, you know, the salvation was brought by the blood of Jesus, but the early church was built on the suffering and the sacrifice and the blood of the early Christians. They're called martyrs in the Bible. That's what they're called. They're called martyrs. 
And, and, and Jesus references them in Revelation chapter six, verse nine, where he said those that were beheaded, the martyrs, those early church members in, Re in Revelation chapter six, I believe it's verse nine, that they will be raised up at the first resurrection is what Jesus teaches, what, the, what John the Revelator teaches. So what, why is this all important? Well, this is important because we are now the elect. We are now in a similar kind of a condition. We are, in a, we are just a few, and we are transitioning as the early church transitioned from the Jewish uh, faith to the Christian church. You and I, we are, we are transitioning from the close of the church age. First the apostate church, then God closed it all together, and then the tribulation, and we are now transitioning in the tribulation to the elect. And we're going to be persecuted, many of us. We will be. Uh, and, and the, the, but we will, we, the, the Lord will have us to be able to step over the ditch called the grave. And we will be able to live and reign and rule with Christ with those who established the early church. So get this picture here, all right? Over here, we got the early church, the first 100 years. Of the, of the Jews becoming Jews, leaving Judaism and becoming Christian, and then many of them being killed, and those that were left fled all over Asia Minor to Colossae, to Galatia, to Philippi, to Ephesus, to Corinth, to Thessalonica, right? Just a few of them, weren't a whole lot of them. That's where they fled to, because they were, they're the ones that were going to carry the message of the, of the, of the establishment of the church. Okay, now, then we get the church established and all in between these two here, we get, and now over here, the, the, that same age of the church age closed, and we get a group called the elect, right? So we got the early church and we got the elect. So we got the two E's, the two E's, the, the, the elect, the early church over here, the elect over here, and so we got the two, the, the E's, the two, the E's, that's what I meant to say, the two, the E's, right? The two, the E's. And so, uh, fascinating, I, I slept through most of my church history classes, I have to tell you that, I, I was sleeping through, but I, I, I passed anyway, and I got a good grade, I think, A, or I think I got A, maybe I got a B, I'll take a B. So, anyway, but I think it's important for us to understand that a lot of people uh, have been called to go to the upper room of the elect, that there were many, there just a few, 120, went to the upper room to start the church. But people like David and well, brother James Hanukkah down in Louisiana, he already knows his mama, his mother told him, and he's solid as a rock. That that man ain't going nowhere. He's as solid as a rock. He, he deaf would have trouble. Deaf would die itself if he ever tried to deal with brother James Hanukkah. But there are other people, and probably just a few, that are being called to come to the upper room, come to come to upper New York City, come to Upper Harlem, come to Atla. Come and sit as the to, to establish the elect, and and we will then establish the, the coming of the kingdom of of of, of God, the the, the 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 greatest prophecy ever, really, the the prophecy of the of the birth of Jesus was great. Well, what did I say? Because I because I, I gave the two great prophets. I gave one great prophecy was the coming. Of, I, I said the greatest prophecy really was the prophecy of the tribulation. So let's get straight about that the greatest prophecy of this coming. But in the tribulation teaching in verse 29 of Matthew's gospel, chapter 24, is at, at verse 30, Jesus said, and then you'll see the Son of Man appearing. So we can make all that one great prophecy that the, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is, that, that, that is what needs to be taught in every church. The Catholics need to be teaching it. The Jews need to be teaching it. You know, rather than the Jews teaching, I'm going to get my friend, Brother David Koss, back on the line. I don't know if David is listening now, but I'm going to get him back on the line, have him talk to me about that third temple. I don't think it's going to happen. But, you know, rather than the Jews teaching that, that the building of the third temple as a prophecy, they ought to be, the Jews ought to be teaching that Jesus is coming back again. Imagine that. If the Reformed Jews, the Orthodox Jews, I don't give, put, put, the Reformed Jews, I don't pay very much attention to them. I, they're not really Jews. They're members of the synagogue of Satan. But they are the Orthodox Jews who ought to be teaching the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what they should be teaching, and maybe they hear me and some of them, you know, maybe the Lord will let me get a, a, a voice to reach out to them. I don't know. But that's what needs to be taught today, that Jesus is coming back again, not prosperity. 
Because if you get a hold of God's word, you're going to be blessed. Well, we can talk about the fundamentals, but you're going to be blessed. You're going to be healed. You're going to be delivered. In fact, you know, we have been teaching that the, 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 the trust in the Lord teaching is a, the survival kit that has become the North Star of the elect. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed if you focus on the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think a lot of people like David are concerned as to whether or not they are worthy. I mean, a lot of people, some of y'all have done a lot of things. But I'm going to tell you in your early days, well, you made some mistakes. That's what it was. So, well, Pastor, I can't, I can't forget it. I keep thinking about it and I keep thinking about it. I keep thinking about it. Well, don't make them no more. Let me tell you how I deal with that. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you up front because a lot of y'all made some evil, uh, uh, ugly mistakes and you think you, well, God has forgiven you. You know, yeah, but you say, but I keep thinking about it. But you've been forgiven. You've been forgiven. So, but yeah, Pastor, I keep thinking. But here's what I do. Here's what I do. You ever hear how often I talk about I went to prison? Now, that whole lot of people have been in prison. A whole lot of people, you know, in church, they've been saved and everything. They don't talk about it no more. You never hear them say anything about it. Oh, a lot of people don't know a lot of that. You never hear them say anything about it. They say, why are you talking about it three, two or three times every time you get up to preach? That's all we got to hear. You know why? Because I, that's how I deal with it. It was an awful thing. thing. It was an awful time. But that's how I deal with it. But I've been forgiven. Even you forgive me, right? But that's how I deal with it. And because I've been forgiven. But the other thing is, is then I stomp down on anybody. A lot of people, you know, say, Pastor, man, he too strict. You know, he's this and he's that and he's always rebuking us and all that kind of stuff and, you know, and telling us we can't do this and we can't do that. Well, I'm telling you so you don't make the same mistakes I made. I'm telling you so you don't run around like a, like a chicken with your head cut off. You ought to be glad that I'm rebuking you all the time. You ought to be glad that, I'm, that, I'm, that I won't let you do all the kind of things, all that sinning you want to do, all that stuff. You want to do it, but I won't let you do it. You ought to be glad because it brings pain and misery. And the other thing is that, you know, you're young. So, but you've been forgiven. This is a bit of a news blog we do looking at spiritual wickedness in high places for the most part, making uh, some observations about it and giving people a biblical foundation to the way of interpreting rather than have uh, uh, Sean Hannity or Laura Ingram or Janine Pirro or Anderson Cooper or Rachel Maydow or Don Lemon, uh, Rush Limbaugh interpret what's going on in the world. You come to me and I'll tell you based on what the Word of God says. They'll just give you their worldly sinful view. But the man will tell you what God has said whether to say yea or nay, whether to go or to stay. You'll be led by the word of Almighty God. Come to the Manning Report on a daily basis to interpret the spiritual wickedness in high places because there's plenty of it that's going on. And so I am he. I'm the Lord, sir. James David Righteous Rebel Manning. And I'm here to serve you with news and information.